Mary is is proudly one of the few Joint Commission Certified Comprehensive Stroke Centers in Los Angeles, offering the highest level of stroke care to our patients. Some of our other neuroscience services include neuro-oncology, spine, stroke research, neurorehabilitation, and of course, the treatment of movement disorders. Providence Little Company of Mary Medical Center is proud to be a partner of the Pacific Neuroscience Institute PNI, who we call them. Their expert physicians offer a wide range of advanced neuroscience specialty services. We are also funded by the American Parkinson's Disease Association, the AB, APDA Center. And um, Providence, along with the PNI team, are considered a referral center for Parkinson's patients. Our Providence Consortium of 51 hospitals allows us to leverage additional neurologic expertise across the system and supports the provision, the provision of the most up-to-date evidence-based practice care. So we are joined this evening by our neuroscience experts, Dr. Natalie Diaz and Dr. Jean-Philippe Langevin. But before I get started, I wanna let everybody know that this is a one hour long presentation and we will have plenty of time for questions at the end please use the Q&A box to type any questions you have throughout the event, and we'll do our best to get to each question at the end of the presentations. We'll not be opening it up for attendees to speak on this webinar. Before I introduce our first speaker for this evening, we're joined by Bob Lenner from the Providence Medical Foundations to share information on this year's open enrollment. Here is Bob to share a little more. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Lehner. I'm the director of marketing for the three LA medical foundations. And what um, Katie has asked me, uh, what they've asked me to do is really to talk a little bit about the upcoming Medicare open enrollment uh, period, which starts in about two weeks. So if you go to the next slide, what I'm, I wanna do here is to literally give you some basic information about Medicare. For those of you who are eligible for Medicare or, or are turning 65, uh, the important things that you should know is, is that Providence as an organization has been well involved in the community in terms of making sure that we get the right information to uh, individuals who, who need information about Medicare plans, uh, and we give them different options of doing this. Uh, we work with the health plans and the brokers uh, to provide that relevant information. Uh, Medicare open enrollment uh, uh, begins October 15th and ends December 7th. Um, the one of the things that we do is we, um, uh, what, in terms of getting information to you, is that we offer uh, several options. To, to get the information to, so you get the right plan that meets your healthcare needs. So one of the things that we do is, is that we work with a, an online brokerage firm called eHealth. So uh, the, we can, yeah, individuals can phone eHealth uh, and that information it will be available when we start our marketing efforts on October 1st. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, you can compare plans through eHealth in terms of side-by-side -side comparisons of the plans that we accept. You can uh, uh, attend a virtual meeting, and we're hoping that with the uh, that we'll be able to have in-person meetings uh, in the South Bay um, uh, in, in the near future. Uh, we also have the ability to talk to a broker who uh, works very closely with us and can provide that information in terms of what what uh, what kind of information is best for you. So, in order to get you know, that contact, um, uh, so watch for uh, newspaper ads that will run in the Daily Breeze. Uh, we'll be running digital ads uh, all through that, that uh, open enrollment period. We will be dropping a lot of direct mail. We'll be doing social media and we'll be doing other things too. So basically that's uh, an encapsulated uh, information about what we do, what we wanna do for the community. And uh, Katie, it's all yours. That's great. Thank you, Bob. Um, thank you for providing that great information. Okay. So everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want our attendees to know that the information provided 
for this program is for educational purposes only. You should always consult your healthcare provider if you have any questions regarding a medical condition or treatment. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the evening, Dr. Natalie Diaz. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Diaz is a board certified neurologist. She completed her residency training at Northwestern University in Chicago and went on to do a two year fellowship in Parkinson's disease and movement disorders at UCLA. She spent nearly 15 years with UCLA as faculty on staff at the affiliated LA County Public Hospitals at Harbor, UCLA and Torrance before joining PNI in Providence two years ago. Dr. Diaz is the director of the Movement Disorder Clinic for PNI Providence um, at Torrance. She has also been an active researcher in the field of movement disorders for nearly 15 years, mainly in the area of Parkinson's disease and clinical trials. She is leading the first movement disorders clinical research trial next month and will be introducing additional trials. You will hear more about her research during Dr. Diaz's talk today. But first, a little fun fact about Dr. Diaz is that she is fluent in Spanish, which I know our Spanish speaking patients greatly appreciate. Welcome, Dr. Diaz. Uh, thank you very much, Catrice, and welcome everybody. Good evening. Um, thank you for joining today. And I'm uh, so excited that there has been such a um, interest in uh, listening to our, our symposium today. Um, hopefully everybody here can see my screen. Um, so I'm gonna be talking today about, let me see why it's not moving forward. I'm going to be talking today about two of the most common movement disorders that we see in our clinics, essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. Um, and in the short time that we have, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, where we are in our knowledge and our treatment and where we're heading in some of the research that we're doing. So starting with essential tremor, this is considered the most common movement disorder. Um, last estimates, it, it affects roughly about 7 million people in this country alone and really can occur at any age. There seems to be two peaks of onset, um, generally around the 20s or 30s, although some of the younger patients will say their tremor maybe even started when they were children. And then there tends to be an older peak that starts in the 60s, 70s or 80s. This is considered mainly a tremor disorder that progresses solely over time, but it can start to impact people's daily activities and cause disability. On the flip side, Parkinson's disease is much less common, uh, affects about a million to a million and a half people in this country, tends to occur more at an older age, starting at 60 and above, although about 10% of people can start younger under the age of 50. It is a very slow progressive condition that spans decades. But although tremor can be part of this condition, it can have a whole constellation of symptoms, both movement related and non-movement related that can be a part of it. So let's start with essential tremor. Um, basically, we, we don't have any specific tests, either lab tests or imaging tests to diagnose Parkinson, to, I'm sorry, to diagnose essential tremor. It's essentially a clinical diagnosis that's based on the history of the symptoms a patient has and our examination. And we look for key clinical characteristics. That being the classic one, a tremor in the upper extremities or the arms and hands when they're in motion or what we say an action tremor. And it tends to interfere with people's activities, uh, holding a utensil to eat, holding a cup to drink, um, using a keyboard or a mouse, um, they can also affect handwriting. And so when we're examining these patients, we'll have them draw these circles or write. And as you can see here in my presentation, um, tremor comes out in their writing and can get um, very messy. But unlike Parkinson's disease, in which the handwriting gets very small and difficult to read, the handwriting and essential tremor tends to stay at a normal sort of size, but can get very messy. People can also have a head tremor, what we call a no-no tremor or a yes-yes tremor, and can even have tremor of the voice. Not very often, but can happen. Legs can also be involved. And this tremor can slowly progress over time and start to impact people's activities during the day and become disabling. 
A good number of people, more than 50%, have other family members that have tremor as well. So sometimes that can be a key indicator that this is essential tremor. And one of the very interesting things is this type of tremor tends to improve with alcohol in a lot of people. So a little glass of wine or a cocktail and people report that their tremor gets a lot better. That's very important to us because tremor tends to activate some of the same brain networks that some of the medications we use work on. And so if people respond to alcohol, usually it's an indicator they're going to respond well to some of our medications. Again, in part of our diagnosis, we try to exclude other things that can also bring on tremor. Um, there are a lot of medications out there that can bring on tremor in somebody who's got a propensity and I put a little list here of typical types of medications that we, we kind of go through, make sure people aren't on. We make sure that somebody doesn't have thyroid disease or liver or kidney disease. So we'll check blood work to look out for those things and do a full neurological examination to make sure that there aren't any other findings on an exam that would suggest another condition such as Parkinson's disease, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Once we make that diagnosis, if the tremor is not too bad, or in addition to medications, there's a variety of aids and devices that are available. Things like weights that can be put on eating utensils, on writing utensils, in drinking um, um, apparatus um, that try to weigh down the tremor so that it, it helps it um, reduce the tremor. There are vibra vibrating utensils that try to vibrate at a similar frequency to a person's tremor, try to cancel that out. There is adaptive clothing that try to make um, that task easier for people. So magnetic buttons that just snap or their shoes without laces um, and even technology that helps with computer use, either voice activated typing or there's software that helps cancel out tremor when using a mouse. There's also a variety of wearable devices that people can wear on their wrist or their hands um, that stimulate the nerves that go to the hand or they may have weights to weigh down um, the hands so that there's no tremor or try to dampen them out. And so there's a variety of things that people can try. This is not an exhaustive list. You can find a list on the International Essential Tremor Foundation website of all the things that are available. Some of them are covered by insurance or partially uncovered by insurance, some are not. So we usually refer people to occupational therapy to discuss some of these and see which ones might be appropriate and try to get coverage for them. If the tremor starts to impact people's activities, there are a variety of medications that we have available. We have two first-line therapies that have been in use for many years. Uh, propanolol is an old blood pressure medication, and it actually is the only um, FDA-approved medication for essential tremor. It works by trying to dampen down sort of the activity in muscles and in the nerves going to the limbs. Um, it can be effective. The other one that's a first-line therapy is an old um, anti-seizure medication called primidone. Um, studies have shown that they're both equally effective in treating um, the tremor, and which one we choose depends on a person's age and what other medical illnesses they may have um, to help us decide. And studies have actually shown that if one is not enough, adding the second one to it is actually even can improve the effect. So sometimes we'll try one or the other, and if we don't get the tremor control we want, we may add the other one to it. There's a variety of other second and third light agents that we try. If people don't tolerate the first line or if they're not effective enough, we can add it or switch them out. Um, our third light agents, which I've highlighted here <clears throat> in red, um, our sedatives in the family of Valium, I've put it there just because sometimes I see patients that are on it, but we tend not to use them very often because they can be sedating, they can have addiction problems, um, and can have tolerance issues. Um, injections of Botox, yes, Botox that we use for wrinkles can also be used um, for certain types of tremor, like a head tremor, or sometimes even a hand tremor, if we can get the insurance to cover it. Um, it's a muscle relaxer and can sometimes help dampen down the, but it also has the potential side effect weakness. So our goal with these medications is to try to reduce the tremor by about 50%. These are not wonderful medications, but they are what we have at this time. And um, for some people that's all they need and, and, and we can get away with these medications. Um, but the truth is, we don't really understand essential tremor, what's going on in the brain. And so these medications are really just band-aids trying to down, um, 
bring down and dampen electrical activity in the brain and thus can have a lot of potential side effects for some people. Surgery can be a great option for those people that have a lot of tremor um, and, and uh, are good, good candidates for surgery. Deep brain stimulation has been around for more than 20 years. It's been shown to be a very effective treatment with 90% or almost complete resolution of tremor in most people and can be effective out to 10 or 15 years or longer. Both hands can be treated, both sides. And we do know that over time, it can be adjusted should tremor start to creep in. And Dr. Langevin will talk a little bit more about that. Um, MRI-focused ultrasound um, therapy has been around for about five or six years now. Um, it's only currently approved to do one side, so people have to pick one side or the other. And here what we do is we pick a side and um, high beam ultrasound rays are shot through the skull to try to create a lesion in the same area where DBS electrodes are placed. There's no anesthesia, there's no major surgery, but it's not fully non-invasive because you're creating a little lesion, burning a little lesion in that part of the brain. So there is the potential for side effects and the long-term sort of efficacy of this hasn't been completely shown. So um, it's an early promising therapy. We'll see how it pounds out over time. There's a lot of research going into understand uh, essential tremor as well as try to develop new therapies. Like I mentioned, we don't really know yet what causes essential tremor. Um, from animal and human studies, we think that what happens is um, there's certain cell, uh, cell groups in the deep part of the brain that we call the cerebellum that fine tune movements and dampens down unwanted movements that sort of atrophy over time. And that allows certain other um, uh, cell groups deep in the brain and the brainstem to possibly start spontaneously firing and creating oscillations in the brain that then sort of transmit up to as tremor into the upper extremities. And there's a lot of research looking at different imaging tools and physiologic studies to try to figure that out. Um, there's some research going in trying to find new treatments to hone in on some of this um, postulated theories. So T-type calcium channel blockers, these are channels that are in some of those neurons that we think are spontaneously firing to try to prevent that, that sort of spontaneous firing. There's two companies that are looking at these and we're hoping we're in negotiations to maybe be one of the sites that's um, gonna be uh, researching these, um, these medications and also looking at medications that maybe enhance that inhibitory control of the spontaneous firing, kind of like our current medications but more sort of targeted so people don't have a lot of potential side effects. There's also improved techniques for DBS and surgery that's, that they're looking at, um, whether ultrasound can be done effectively and safely on both sides and long-term and adaptive techniques of, of DBS, which Dr. Langevin, I think we'll talk about a little bit later. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about Parkinson's disease. This is a different animal than essential tremor. This is a very slowly progressive condition of the brain and the nervous system that progresses over decades. Um, we do know what's happening in the brain, the cause of which we're still trying to figure out, but what happens is there is accelerated aging and as a result, atrophy and, of certain cell groups in different parts of the brain resulting in chemical deficiencies. Um, the most common one being dopamine, um, which a chemical deficiency in dopamine results in some of the movement abnormalities. And in those areas where there's atrophy, there's abnormal proteins that are being formed that then fold into these clumps and, and stick together into these bodies that we call Lewy bodies. Um, this is what we call a Lewy body condition. Um, the dopamine is one of the chemicals that gets altered, but there's a number of other chemicals also um, that, that get altered in Parkinson's serotonin, which may have to do with mood, norepinephrine, which may have to do with blood pressure control, as well as maybe some of the walking issues people can have, and acetylcholine, which may have to do with attention and maybe memory issues. Now, there are a lot of symptoms that people with Parkinson's can have. Tremor can be part of it, and it's a little different from essential tremor. This type of tremor tends to happen in a limb, up arm or leg, or sometimes in the jaw when people are sitting and relaxing, uh, watching TV or talking, and you, they get a little bit of tremor that comes out. But yes, usually when they go to do things, the tremor gets better. 
may also come out when they're walking. Um, they also slow down and have muscle stiffness resulting in things like a low voice, a loss of facial expression. They may be slow in getting up and doing things. Their walking may change. They stoop, they they're, take little steps, they shuffle. They may not swing their arms when they walk and can affect balance. And these are all the symptoms that we can see and that we test for to try to make this diagnosis. But there's also a lot that's going on under the surface that you don't see when you see somebody with Parkinson's that we have to ask, but really can be a big part of their condition. These are things like constipation, bladder issues, problems with low blood pressure and dizziness when standing, fatigue, sexual dysfunction, changes in mood, changes in memory and thinking, um, changes in sleep talking or yelling or acting out their dreams. Um, so there can be a lot of symptoms at play in Parkinson's disease, but you know, this is a very individual condition. And so, you know, the, the which symptoms a patient has, uh, what intensity and how they progress over time can be very different from person to person and how we approach our treatment can be very different from person to person. How we diagnose the condition like essential tremor is really just clinical at this point. There's no specific blood test or imaging test. Um, we base it on the medical history of the symptoms a patient has, how they progress, our neurological examination, looking for some of the key movement related findings and how they respond to some of our classic dopamine based medications. And with this studies have shown that we're accurate more than 95% of the time. On occasion, if we're not sure, we may test some blood tests. We might do an MRI looking for strokes or tumors or things like that. Or if there's a question of whether, if somebody has a lot of tremor and there's a question, is this essential tremor of Parkinson's, we may get something that's called a DAT scan. What this looks at is those dopamine producing cells in the brain. And normally somebody should have like this comma shaped appearance. Um, if somebody has Parkinson's with atrophy of the cell group, they lose the tail of that comma and they become more like a period as you can see on the right there. Whereas somebody with essential tremor who's got normal dopamine producing capabilities, they will look like somebody who doesn't have Parkinson's. So we may use the scan sometimes to help us distinguish between essential tremor and Parkinson's and somebody who has a lot of tremor. And that is available here at Providence Little Company of Mary. We have a whole arsenal of medications available for Parkinson's. At last count, there's like 19 or 20 medications that are available, all symptomatic, all there just to treat the symptoms. They don't stop the condition or stop its progression. There are certain themes here. They're based on trying to improve the amount of dopamine a patient is making. They try to act like dopamine. They try to prolong the life of dopamine in the brain. Um, occasionally we have, if people are unable to tolerate these or we need more than just dopamine-based drugs, there's a few other ones that we can try. And the ones that are in red are the newest ones that have been, um, that have come out in the last five years. So this is something that's been building and we have a lot of choices. What we use and when we use can be really and So I'm not gonna go into the details of how we treat it. We do also have surgery available for Parkinson's that can be a great therapy for a select group of patients with Parkinson's. Deep brain stimulation has been around for nearly 20 years as well for Parkinson's and studies have shown people can get good control of their symptoms for 10, 15 years or longer. There's a few brain targets that we use, but not everybody's a DBS candidate. So who's a good DBS candidate? And Dr. Langevin will talk about it as well. Patient patients who are healthy enough to go through surgery, who have a lot of tremor that don't respond to medications, who have good response to the medications, but they fluctuate in their response during the day or over time get some of the involuntary movements like Michael J. Fox. This is somebody who's gonna do well with DBS. DBS is not an option or people don't like the idea of DBS, another option, it's not really surgical, but it's called Duopa. And this is where there's a, a, an implanted tube into the small intestine uh, attached to an infusion. And the classic medication for Parkinson's called levodopa is infused continuously. And that's great for people who have good response to levodopa, but they wax and wane in sort of their response during the day and tries to give them a good sort of stable effect during the day. So those are two good options uh, if people are sort of in those later stages 
with some of the variation in their medication effect. There is a lot of money and time and research going on in Parkinson's disease, um, some of it to try to find, the, find what's going on and, and understand why some of the pathology that I talked about is happening. There's also a lot of money going into trying to develop new therapies. Um, in 2020, there were close to 150 therapies, symptomatic therapies trying to develop new um, um, to treat our current symptoms, the bulk of that being an early part of Parkinson's disease, some in the advanced stages, these entail trying to find new formulation or new delivery to our current medications, whether they're patches or infusions. Um, there's also research into non-dopamine-based medications. There's also a lot of research going into what we call disease-modifying therapies, trying to attack some of the pathology that we see. So vaccinations against some, against some of those um, pathological proteins or small molecules that are developed, trying to prevent those proteins from accumulating in the brain. Um, there are certain genes that we think might be at play in Parkinson's, so how to modify the expression of those genes and also um, therapies to try to reduce the inflammation that's happening in the brain. So there's a lot of ways that they're trying to attack what's happening in the brain to see if they can stop it or slow down the progression of this condition. So that's my talk. I just wanna spend a moment to talk a little bit about movement disorders here at Providence Little Company of Mary. So Pacific Movement Disorder Center, which is part of Pacific Neurosciences and we're uh, aligned with Providence. We are an American Parkinson's Disease Association Center. Um, we have uh, clinical care um, both here in Torrance as well as Santa Monica where we started. So we see patients and, and get referrals from the community um, to see Parkinson's disease essential tremor and a variety of other movement disorders. We do a lot of education such as today's symposium we have a monthly webinar called Everything Parkinson's um, where we talk about different topics. And um, we also have um, some APDA funded programs for new diagnosis uh, patients. We are aligned with the Par Providence uh, Movement Disorder Focus Group. These are movement disorder uh, experts across the Pacific Northwest at different Providence institutions to discuss expected practices and align care. Um, and then this is our newest arm um, that I'm most excited for because I've been a researcher for nearly 15 years. Um, our research arm, which we're going to be starting some research trials. Um, our first one is going to be starting in the next month. This is working with a company uh, that's come up with a product for advanced Parkinson's disease with dyskinesias. That's um, like Michael J. Fox. If you people have those unwanted dance-like movements that are bothersome uh, to them. So that's a, a new study. As I mentioned, we're going to be aligning with a company, hopefully to bring one of those calcium channel blockers uh, for essential tremor, hopefully in the next six months. And we're also in discussion with some companies to bring some disease modifying therapies for early uh, Parkinson's before they've even started medications to see if we can change the directory, the trajectory of this condition over time. So if anybody's interested in, in research, stay tuned and, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll um, have something that's of interest to people. There's some resources uh, about our center and some of the national websites where people can get a little bit more information. Wow, thank you, Dr. Diaz, for that great talk. Great overview on um, just the latest treatments for movement disorders. It's really exciting to hear kind of what's coming down the pike with, with the research and, and additional options that we can really offer our patients here in the community. Um, great talk, thank you. Okay, well, next um, I would like to then go ahead and um, introduce our next speaker. It's Dr. Um, Jean-Philippe Langevin. Dr. Langevin is a board certified and fellowship trained neurosurgeon specializing in the surgical treatment of move movement disorders, epilepsy, and psychiatric conditions. He has extensive experience using neuromodulation to treat conditions such as Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, dystonia, epilepsy, and obsessive compulsive disorder. He employs a variety of treatment modalities, including deep brain stimulation and vagal nerve stimulation and interstitial laser ablation. 
He's the Director of Restorative Neurosurgery and Deep Brain Stimulation Program at the Pacific Movement Disorders Center. Welcome, Dr. Langevin. Thanks, Catrice, and uh, thank you everybody for um, joining us today for our lecture. Uh, so my portion is gonna be on the um, uh, surgical treatment of um, uh, movement disorder. Um, uh, mostly mostly uh, Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. Um, and so the objective of what I wanted to cover today was basically um, you know, just to answer a few questions. Why uh, or when you know, should uh, anybody consider having DBS uh, to treat Parkinson's disease or tremor? Um, and I uh, want to also answer a question about how the surgery is performed. Um, and finally, uh, what happens after the surgery? So like what's important to consider once the surgery is completed uh, to recover well after the procedure. Um, yeah, so when to consider surgery. Uh, so there's many things uh, you know, to keep in mind, uh, but uh, some of the cardinal uh, features are like when uh, someone feels like they have too much off time. So meaning that you respond well to the medication um, but you're going through those periods where uh, you're doing well um, and in uh, periods where like the, uh, the, this, the medication wears off. And so then during that time, you're, you're not uh, experiencing a good response and motor response with the medication. So you're going through those uh, peaks and troughs throughout the day. And so that's limiting your activity. Um, Another, uh, another time to consider having DBS is when the medication uh, would work well, but you have too many intolerable side effects. Uh, so from the medication, and so as a result of that, uh, you can't take as much medication as what you would need to control your symptoms. Um, and there are some symptoms that are uh, predominantly improved with uh, DBS uh, in excess to what you would achieve with medication. And so some of those symptoms uh, include tremor and dyskinesia. Uh, so if you predominantly have uh, Parkinson's disease, for example, that's affecting, uh, causing tremor and causing um, uh, dyskinesia, uh, then you know, in those cases, DBS may provide you uh, better control than just the medication alone. Uh, in general, we, we tell people, you know, a good time to consider uh, discussing with your neurologist the uh, possibility of DBS is when you're thinking about quitting uh, your hobbies or your job. So something that's important to you, to you and your quality of life. So if you're thinking about quitting it, uh, then it's probably a good time uh, to consider DBS as an uh, adjunct therapy to your medication. And the reason we say that is because it's much easier uh, to keep going with a job or a hobby uh, then uh, try to restart it, you know, after a surgical procedure. So like if we, uh, somebody comes off, it comes into our office and they've already stopped doing the things that they enjoy, it's much less likely that we will get them to a point where they can return to those activities uh, after the DBS. Whereas if we treat them at a time uh, before, um, uh, then, you know, we, we can uh, maintain the activity much longer. So that's, that's what the studies have shown. Uh, many people ask me also, like, what happens after uh, DBS? Like, how is it going to impact my life? Like, things to keep in mind, you know, after the surgery. Uh, and in a nutshell, uh, the goal of the procedure is really to maintain your quality of life and return you to all your activities uh, without limitation, uh, which means that, you know, in terms of sports and activity, there's no real limitation in what you will be able to perform uh, after the procedure. So it's not like we're going to say, okay, you cannot do this sport or that specific activity. Uh, there are things that we like to keep in mind uh, in terms of uh, surgical placement of the implant. Uh, so, you know, somebody uses a lot their right arm during a sport, like playing tennis or bowling. Uh, then we may place the implant on the left side just to make sure that there's no uh, performance limitation. Uh, just from the device, you know, causing like pulling or a sensation in the neck that would affect you performing the sport. Uh, so we like to discuss, you know, we've had patients even using uh, rifles, for example. And then uh, obviously, like we, we don't want the device to be right there uh, on that side, just to, to otherwise it's going to impede the activity, not that the implant would be broken, uh, but it's just going to be like bothering the patient. Uh, in terms of battery maintenance, uh, typically, 
There are two kinds of uh, implants currently in terms of uh, batteries. So there's a rechargeable and a non-rechargeable option. Uh, the rechargeable option is at least good for 15 years and up, uh, but you do have to remember to charge it uh, in general uh, every, uh, so to twice a week is what we recommend. For most patients, uh, charging can take anywhere between 20 minutes to uh, 45 minutes, depending on how depleted the battery is. And it's usually something that's performed, you know, when someone is watching TV or just sitting down uh, relaxing. So it's not something that requires a lot of attention uh, once you're used to using the charger. Um, MRI, so now these uh, devices are MRI compatible. So it used to be a problem that if someone needed a surveillance MRI for uh, an issue like uh, cancer or like, you know, bad joints, um, heart uh, MRI, so like we, we had to be careful about using DBS. Uh, nowadays, most uh, devices are, are compatible to MRI, uh, so it's no longer an issue. And finally, uh, flying and other metal detectors. Uh, so there's no limitation in terms of flying. Um, if you do have a rechargeable device, uh, you have to remember to take your charger uh, if you leave town. And uh, if you go to an outside country, you have to be sure that you have like a, uh, an adapter for the electrical outlet in that country to uh, plug in your charger. Um, and in terms of metal detector, you, you, we recommend that you go through, to try to go through the center, you know, so in between when you exit the store with metal detectors, we recommend to go in between um, the, the paddle as much as possible. Uh, so nowadays, the devices have been insulated from uh, interference, you know, so-called electromagnetic interference. Uh, so it used to be when, when I started, we, we would have uh, patients occasionally that would come into our clinic complaining that um, after exiting stores, like all of a sudden, they, they did feel their tremor was at well control. Uh, and the device had modified uh, their programming. Uh, and so we had to reestablish the proper programming. So, but I'd say that since the latest uh, two generations of devices, we haven't seen those problems. So I think that the manufacturers have uh, figured out ways to better shield uh, the implants from uh, external uh, interference. At the airport, we still recommend to show a card uh, to the TSA agents uh, so that they can use their manual paddle as opposed to the um, the actual detector that you go through. Uh, but yeah, so they uh, present this slide just to show you that essentially you know, our goal here is to get you back to your activities, not to prevent you uh, from doing your activities. These two patients uh, were still enjoying uh, certain hobbies, but in, in the case on the patients on the right, he had stopped because he was concerned at going into the ocean. Uh, he was concerned that the medication would wear off at a time when he was uh, about to catch a wave uh, and then we'd run into trouble. But since the DBS is continuously on in the background uh, so that and, and controlling his uh, symptoms, that gave him enough confidence to resume that activity. Uh, similarly, the patient on the left enjoyed uh, going down the slopes, but he, again, he was concerned that uh, his medication would wear off at the inopportune time you know, at the top of the, of the hill. Um, and so again, here the, the DBS has provided him just enough confidence to, uh, to resume his activities. Uh, in this video, we show a little bit uh, some of the changes um, that can happen, you know, after DBS for Parkinson's disease. So we see a patient here preoperatively uh, showing cardinal symptoms of uh, Parkinson with a lot of slowness of movement, a lot of rigidity um, and bradykinesia. And uh, so the same patient on the right side, you know, after uh, surgery, so you can see that uh, uh, she, you know, she's um, uh, more fluid in her movement. Uh, so obviously here with the help of the physical therapist, but uh, certainly walking with a lot more ease. Uh, so now, nowadays, I'd say in the last uh, five years or so, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, new things, novel um, features with the DBS systems. Um, and part of the reason is that uh, there's more competition now amongst the uh, manufacturers, so they're kind of pushing each other. Uh, but some of the things, some of the features that we have seen that are highly uh, beneficial for patients are the ones uh, that I'm going to go uh, individually. But 
uh, directional current, which basically allows us to program the device to deliver uh, a smaller electrical field to the, the region of interest inside the brain. Um, the most, uh, uh, and the newest, should I say, uh, feature is the brain signal sensing. So I'll explain that in a few slides. Uh, in terms of uh, for the patients, you know, the things that you receive along with the device, so there's the, the updated uh, uh, patient programmer. So like the interface used to be clunky with a lot of menus embedded in a small uh, old fashioned device. Um, and so nowadays it looks much more like a cell phone. So in many cases, it's actually like a cell phone device, uh, commercially available cell phone device. Uh, that's the interface. Um, as I mentioned, MRI compatibility is a big one. So that used to be a big problem for uh, patients, but nowadays you don't need to worry about it. Um, so the devices are safe uh, for MRIs. You just need to mention it to the uh, technician prior to getting your studies uh, that you have a device in. And uh, rechargeable device is another big feature. So for those patients who are uh, uh, you know, interested, and uh, willing to learn how to use their charger, then you can avoid having a replacement of the battery uh, for many years. Uh, these are the devices and what it looks like. So the electrode on the left-hand side. So as you can tell, there's uh, four contacts. So those are the four contacts uh, that are in the target inside the brain. Um, and so we can modulate or uh, shift the electrical current around any uh, of those four contacts or a combination of the four contacts. Uh, so in the middle, that's the uh, device itself that's uh, implanted under the collarbone. Uh, so uh, typically on the right side, but as I mentioned, depending on the activity of the patient, we would place it on the left side. And finally here, uh, there's three images, but it's the same device. So that's the patient programmer for this uh, particular uh, implant from Medtronic. And so you can see this is basically a Samsung uh, Galaxy cell phone uh, that's being used uh, as a patient programmer. Uh, and this is the type of information that you receive. So whether or not your battery, uh, the device is still good uh, it, to make sure that your therapy is still on. Uh, and then uh, uh, depending on specific patients, we can uh, program the device uh, you know, for different features so that you have uh, optimized control of symptoms depending on uh, specific activities that you're doing throughout the day. And on the right-hand side, you can see where it says events. Uh, so these are uh, opportunities where the patients can, uh, we can program these buttons uh, where it says took medication, start exercise or dyskinesia. And the patient can click those buttons uh, when they're having those issues. So let's say your main symptom is tremor or dyskinesia. So that can be programmed into the device. And when you're at home and you're feeling those specific symptoms, you can click um, on those buttons and the device will record a timestamp uh, with some brain activity around that time uh, so that your physicians can review that data uh, once they see you in the clinic. Uh, so this is another manufacturer, again, just to show you uh, uh, the patient programmer right in the middle. So that looks like a iPhone, basically. So that's an Apple uh, iPhone product that's being used as the patient programmer. The physician uses the iPad to uh, program the device. Uh, so again, that's an example of uh, devices that are more uh, patient friendly or like the interface is more user friendly than what we used to have. And the last company in the US is Boston Scientific. So again, you can see in this case, they're using um, the uh, Windows tablet, Surface tablet, and then the patient gets that this programmer uh, still has a uh, uh, user-friendly interface. Uh, so two features that I wanted to touch upon uh, that are uh, newer, uh, newer uh, features, and you may hear your provider uh, tell you a little bit about it. Uh, the first one is directional current. And uh, so you can see on this picture, two electrodes um, in a precise location inside the brain. Um, and we have a, uh, a, a blown up images of that here on the right hand side. So you can see the electrode here. And in this uh, case, you have a circular electrical field around the tip of the electrode. So that's what we have classically uh, around the devices up until now. And so you can see on, on this side, uh, one part of the uh, circular electrical field is encroaching slightly on a nearby structure of the brain. 
And so that's how you know patients can experience uh, some side effects or you know tingling, pins and needles sensation with high intensity stimulation. Uh, and so that, uh, or typically traditionally, it limits how much stimulation we are able to give uh, the patient. Uh, but nowadays with those uh, directional electrodes, uh, the middle two contacts are broken down into uh, sub leaflets. And basically uh, it allows us to push the electrical field on one side or another. So in this case, they push the field uh, towards the left side or the center of the brain to avoid encroaching on the area uh, on the right side. And uh, just to, you know, for those people who are interested, so you have the four contacts here traditionally are full rings, four full rings. In the newer uh, settings, you have two full rings um, at the tip and the one at the base. Uh, and then the rings in the middle are broken down into different subunits. And so that's how the physicians can push the electricity on one field, uh, one side of the brain versus the other. The advantages of that, so as I mentioned, is that you, you would have experience uh, potentially less side effect with the stimulation. Um, another benefit is that you may feel more benefit from the stimulation. And the reason is because uh, uh, the area of interest inside the brain may see or receive more stimulation uh, than with traditional electrodes because we're not limited uh, by nearby structures. So we can direct um, a higher intensity electrical field to the region of interest. And at the same time, uh, we are also able to spare the battery and use less energy because we're using a smaller, globally smaller electrical field uh, but that electrical field is, is highly uh, intense and directed towards the region of interest. Uh, the second feature of those newer batteries that I wanted to discuss is that um, uh, sensing activity or basically a bi-directional uh, device. Um, and so what I mean by that is that the device can actually record or uh, save you know, some of the activity inside the brain as opposed to only stimulating. Um, so the DBS therapy that you receive or the stimulation that you receive from the device is exactly the same than with traditional device. Uh, the difference is that um, the device is also recording some activity inside the brain. And as I showed you at the, uh, uh, a few slides before, you have that patient programmer with the different uh, buttons on it. And so you can uh, trigger a recording yourself. So like if your symptoms are tremor or freezing of the gate, uh, then you can click the appropriate button and it's gonna save a timestamp uh, as well as a, a snapshot inside the device. Uh, and so globally, this is what it looks like uh, from the physician standpoint. I'm not gonna go obviously into the details, uh, but this is how the brain activity of an actual patient uh, looks like. And so, you know, it gives us these uh, uh, spikes and wave, uh, basically, and we're interested in the second spike uh, for uh, the purpose of the treatment. And so you can tell that we're getting uh, all these wave activity for all the different contacts on the electrode. And so that uh, may suggest to us which contact might be closest to the hot spot for the symptoms. Uh, so then we select, okay, so in this case, we're selecting uh, 7.8. Uh, that's a frequency of brain activity or the language that the, the cells inside the brain are speaking to each other. And the device will be tracking that specific activity passively in the background without uh, the patient feeling anything from it. And then month after month, we can follow this activity. Uh, so you can see here a timestamp uh, different days uh, of the month. And we're essentially seeing that activity throughout the day, uh, left side versus right side. And we can tell if the activity is uh, increasing or decreasing over time based on the changes uh, that we are making in the clinic. Uh, this is an example here of the patient uh, recording some activity. In this particular instance, the patient had itchiness as a symptom. And so that's being recorded. And so we are looking at the activity of the brain at that specific uh, symptom over time. And then we can elect to track it to see if we're making headways uh, with our stimulation parameters. And alive in the clinic, uh, this is what we can see here. So we have all the different graphs here, the brain activity, and you can see three options, right? So like the stimulation being off in blue, uh, the right electrode being on or the left electrode being on. 
and in this particular example at those parameters you know of stimulation uh, all three curves are essentially superimposed so uh, we're not making headways with this uh, program however uh, in this case here you know once we start the electrode either the right side or the left side electrode you, you can see a separation between the off time uh, and the on uh, stimulation and so this could be a program or a stimulation uh, parameters of the DBS that are actually making headways and treating the symptoms of the patient. And so that's, that's the kind of information that we are looking at into our clinic to make decision on uh, programming parameters. So not only are we looking if the patient is uh, better with certain stimulation parameters, but we're also looking at those graphs to see does it make sense? Are we changing or altering some of the brain activity that's uh, related to the symptoms? Uh, so potential advantage of uh, this type of technology, uh, it may help us out selecting the best electrode contact, you know, so uh, we can go through all the contacts during our clinic and figure out which one is better. Uh, however, we can track the brain activity over a long period of time to see where uh, the abnormal activity that's uh, related to the symptoms of tremor and Parkinson's disease, which contact seems to be in the hot spot based on uh, tracking it over period of time of a uh, month, you know, or several weeks. As I mentioned, we can also uh, uh, select the DBS parameters, you know, that are going to treat the symptoms optimally. Uh, just like I showed you, we can target a specific symptom uh, and a specific brain activity to see if a parameter is able to uh, decrease it uh, live in our clinic. And then we, then we can select those parameters when you go home. Uh, it allows us also to track the symptoms over time, right? So like you're at home and, you know, you're, you're feeling particularly bad about your symptoms. You want to tell your physician. So you click that button and it leaves a stamp, uh, a time stamp at the particular time during the day when you're having the symptoms. You don't need to remember. You don't need to write it down. It leaves also a snapshot of the brain activity at that specific time. So then we know which activity we're trying to correct. Um, and so that uh, can allow us in the clinic to modify the programming parameters to affect that symptom specifically, uh, but it uh, can also tell us at what time during the day you're having most of the problems, so that can lead to also medication adjustment as well. And finally, we think that in the future, uh, you know, with artificial intelligence, the device is probably going to be able to program itself, although, you know, we're far from being there yet, but eventually, you know, the device should be able to recognize that brain activity that's abnormal and optimize the parameter automatically. Some of the symptoms that are not improved uh, with the, um, uh, the stimulation, so uh, typically uh, symptoms of the uh, core of the body and so that's like freezing or balance issues, um, uh, swallowing difficulties or difficulties with eyelid, you know, keeping your eyelid open, or obviously uh, cognitive issues. So those are symptoms that are not improved with DBS. And so we, we try to be careful not to, um, uh, to exclude those, you know, before the surgery. Uh, so this example shows you how uh, DBS can help out with the uh, tremor uh, reduction uh, and I'll pause here this uh, video. So on the patients, on the same patient, obviously on both videos. Um, on the left side, the DBS was turned off, uh, whereas on the right, uh, the patient just turned uh, the DBS on. And so you can see, like going through uh, the examination here, uh, the changes that DBS has made. So like uh, you know, a lot of those uh, patients will tell us that. Basic functions in life, like uh, assigning checks uh, or using utensils to eat, uh, so it's highly disabling. And so you can see the difference with DBS versus uh, no DBS on, and the same picture on the same day. So oftentimes patients will tell us that it's the first time that they can have a legible writing in many years um, after the surgery. Uh, so I'll briefly discuss how we perform the surgery here at uh, Providence Little Company of Mary. 
Uh, we have, uh, you know, four uh, concepts that we follow. So we want to do a surgery that's minimally invasive um, so that uh, recovery is faster. Uh, uh, obviously, we are focused on safety and making sure that we obtain as much symptoms improvement uh, as possible and enhance recovery so that you can return to your life as uh, soon as possible after the procedure. Um, so we perform the surgery in two, uh, three steps. So the first one being performed in our clinic. Um, where the patient comes in and uh, we place small markers. And so this is a step that's done using numbing medication uh, where we make a small opening um, and shave a little bit of hair to place these uh, markers that are then hidden under the skin. Uh, so in one suture to close them off. And these markers uh, allows us to plan um, the uh, placement of the electrodes uh, prior to the surgery while you're at home. So this is a, a representation of the patient. Uh, and uh, basically we are planning in this case, the two electrodes in green uh, to go into our precise spot and avoiding any important structures in the brain. And the computer de uh, designs uh, this uh, four legged uh, device made of a plastic polymer. And uh, once the device will be placed uh, on the patient during the surgery, then it guides the two electrodes directly uh, where uh, the uh, where they're planned uh, to go for the for the, the therapy. Uh, so during the surgery, there is no head uh, fixation. Uh, we are simply placing those uh, uh, this uh, 3D printed custom made uh, uh, device that's going to guide the electrode. We make a small opening exactly where we need to go, with a small uh, opening in the skull to place the electrode. And once the electrodes are placed, uh, then uh, the neurologist uh, will uh, perform a, an examination to confirm that the symptoms are improved and that there are no side effects with the stimulation. Um, and uh, then once that is completed, the electrodes are tunneled or placed under the scalp uh, so that it's uh, completely hidden and there's no components visible of the implant. Um, and finally, a week later, we complete the surgery by placing uh, the pulse generator, so the small battery under the collarbone, uh, and we uh, pass the wire using this uh, special uh, tunneler. And so at the end of the, uh, and this is an outpatient procedure where the patients go home uh, the same day after the surgery and it's performed under general anesthesia so that you're completely asleep uh, for this procedure. And uh, so finally, all the implant uh, components are, are hidden under the skin and not visible from the outside. And they communicate with uh, the device externally, uh, non-invasively. Uh, things are important to keep in mind uh, after the surgery, uh, during the immediate post-operative period, um, is to continue the Parkinson medications uh, after the surgery and uh, to uh, you know, perform a lot of early ambulation to make sure that you maintain your strength and your stamina. Uh, so the DBS is not on after the surgery. Uh, so we typically wait a few weeks prior to starting the stimulation, which means that the only therapy you have during that time is your medication. And oftentimes keep in mind, anytime you're hospitalized um, uh, for a prolonged period of time, um, you know, typically the uh, pharmacies and the hospitals do not carry uh, the complex formulation of medication for Parkinson's disease. So like the basic uh, medications like Cinemet are available, but the more, uh, the fancier, the newer medications are typically not available. So it's a good, always a good idea to bring your own uh, for, during the hospitalization. Uh, early mobilization. So we work a lot with our allied uh, provider, nursing staff, and physical therapy to make sure that our patients are up and about after the surgery and that the pain is well controlled. And uh, so most of our patients are discharged typically on the first day postoperatively uh, or the second uh, day after the surgery. Uh, so finally, in conclusion, uh, DBS is a good option for those patients who respond well to uh, Cinemet or uh, medications for Parkinson's disease, but have a lot of fluctuations with uh, medication losing its efficacy. Um, the, the clinical outcome obviously will depend on uh, our job, you know, being done properly in terms of uh, precise placement of the uh, electrode. And so we're really focused on that during the procedure. And uh, just remember that uh, right after surgery, um, the medication are still the only uh, therapy acting uh, since the DBS is not turned on for uh, a, a few weeks after the procedure. So on that, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, and so we're going to be ready to take questions.
Thank you, Dr. Langevin. Thank you for that great talk. I mean, I really, um, it's really nice to see the images of each of the devices. Um, nice to see the, um, how we are tailoring treatment um, based off of our patient's symptoms. Um, and those videos, wow, you know, they kind of pretty much just speak for themselves. It's really, really great to see that. So thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, everyone, we realize we've gone over just a little tiny bit here. So um, if you're willing to stay on, we'll go through um, a couple of questions. Um, but before we do that, um, if we're gonna put a poll up um, on the side of your screen. If you can give us your honest feedback, we'd really appreciate it. Um, but now we'll just kind of just move straight into um, a couple of questions that we have here um, that have come up for both of the talks. Um, I'll start out with a question that came up early on. Let me get my questions to where I can see them. Um, it says, um, what do you know about autoimmune brain disease or if there's any information on autoimmune brain disease and this came up during Dr. Diaz's talk um, or any other syndrome that involves myoclonus and balance issues cause treatments and outcomes. Okay, um, so, so for people that don't know autoimmune disease, we talk about conditions where the body sort of creates proteins or antibodies that um, we think kind of turn on itself and start attacking the body. And it's a very sort of broad topic. There's a lot of autoimmune diseases that have that potential to affect the nervous system. And there's definitely um, syndromes that have been described um, that can, you know, have tremor, can have myoclonus, can have, you know, things that look like Parkinsonism associated with it. So definitely when we have conditions that are outside of the box of what I've talked about today that we know um, very well, we, we sometimes will check for autoimmune disorders. Um, we um, have a variety of, of tests that we can do, blood tests, or sometimes we'll test spinal fluid or do MRIs. And how we treat really depends on the, the, the type of you know, autoimmune disorder that people have, you know, if it's related to lupus or if it's related to a type of cancer that they have. Um, so there's different ways that we can treat those disorders. So it's kind of a broad question. There's a lot of autoimmune conditions that can affect the nervous system um, in different ways. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diaz. Mm -hmm. I have another question here. I believe this is probably for Dr. Diaz. Also, um, and, uh, one of our attendees shared that they are an insulin dependent diabetic and they have finger tremors on occasion, which they've never had before. Is there some sort of connection here? Yeah, I mean, definitely um, in, in people who have diabetes and are on diabetes medications, people can always have a little bit of tremor for a variety of different reasons, right? So depending on if they don't have good control of their diabetes, if they're, you know, a little bit hypoglycemic, people tend to get a little bit tremulous that can go along with sweating and other things that, um, you know, make them feel like their, their, their blood sugars are low. Definitely, if their blood pressure, their I'm sorry, their blood sugars are high and not well controlled, people can also get a little tremulous and can affect the deep parts of the brain um, as well. Um, uh, you know, the diabetes can also affect the little nerve endings in the hands and the feet and cause something that we cause that's called neuropathy. And neuropathy is where the sensation and where your distal limbs are in space can get affected. And with that, people can also get a bit of what we call neuropathic tremor. So a little bit of tremulousness as well. So yeah, there can be a variety of reasons. And if, if people have a lot, you know, tremor that's bothersome with diabetes, you know, making sure that they have good control of their diabetes, or if they have anything like loss of sensation, you know, having um, a discussion with their internist or their neurologist about that um, is important. So yeah, it can, it can be seen in, in diabetes, but that's separate from essential tremor. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Diaz. So this next question, let's see, it's about the um, DBS. And if we can highlight about what the initial costs are, maintenance costs that are involved with DBS um, treatment. Yeah, so uh, 
you know, it's it's a little bit of a uh, individualized uh, situation, right? Uh, depending on the uh, specific insurance. Um, what I can say though is that uh, uh, all the major insurance, including Medicare, do recognize uh, DBS as a as a therapy, so it's covered. Um, and in my experience, the vast majority of patients, the the cost of the surgery, uh, you know, was not prohibitive or was not an issue. Um, so it seems like the the out of pocket cost is minimal. Like once the once the insurance covers the the actual surgery. Um, and in terms of the, uh, the maintenance costs, you know, so it's uh, it's basically clinic visits. So it's similar to maintenance of uh, medication, I would say. Um, uh, but yeah, it's it, it's also dependent on the specific insurance carrier. Yeah. All right. I'll direct this one towards you, Dr. Langevin. Um, do we have the DBS equipment here at the Torrance Providence Little Company, Mary Torrance facility? Yes, uh, absolutely. So that's that was one of our uh, priority. You know, you discussed at the beginning the center of, of excellence that were created in, in neuroscience uh, down here, including stroke. So movement disorder was one of the our earliest center that was created. Um, so we've been performing uh, DBS surgery uh, already for approximately four or five years now. Um, and it's it's one of the uh, busier uh, center of DBS for Providence down you know in Southern California. Um, so yes, yeah, certainly we have all the information, that, uh, all the, the equipment, all the the, the, the competence in, in terms of the staff and, and nurses in the hospitals are very used to those kinds of surgeries as well. Great. And um, someone here, this must have come up during our talk on on the research. Um, things that are coming down the pike. Um, are there any therapies that are in the pipeline that will be available in 2022? That's a good question. Um, yeah, there are some therapies that are sort of in the um, third stage of testing. So the final stages of testing in Parkinson's disease, some of them are um, newer ways to give levodopa, which is the classic Parkinson's medication, and there's a few non-dopamine related um, medications that are also in the late stage of testing, so we'll see what those come out as. Um, I think over the last two or three years, we've had, you know, a few medications that have been coming out. So the pace is kind of increasing a little bit faster for Parkinson's disease. For essential tremor, um, I, I'm not sure about 2022, maybe 2023, we'll see. Um, we're, we're hoping some of these um, ones that I highlighted here, which are the ones that are most advanced in our testing, um, will hopefully come out in the next year or two for essential tremor. Great. Um, are there any contraindications to being a DBS candidate? You wanna reiterate that? Dr. Langevin? Uh, yeah, so that's that's also on a case by case basis. You know, I'd say that um, uh, as we're getting uh, more minimally invasive in our surgery, so there's less and less contraindication. Um, so even people were on blood thinner. So, you know, we just manage it by taking them off um, uh, for a few days prior to the surgery, for example. Um, so the main things that we're concerned about DBS, uh, the highest risk is infection because it's a implantable, like it's a foreign body that's implanted. Uh, so someone who would have like an uncontrolled ongoing infection uh, so that, you know, that person we would want to treat the infection first uh, prior to doing DBS. Uh, and for us during the surgery, um, obviously we use uh, antibiotics, uh, you know, at the time of the surgery to cut down the risk to a minimum. Uh, so, but that's the, the main, uh, aside from that, you know, so we do the psychological evaluations uh, prior to the surgery. We just want to make sure that the, the therapy is going to be appropriate for the patient based on the symptoms that they have. And um, uh, for example, that they don't have a lot of uh, cognitive or, or uh, problems, you know, of that nature with thinking uh, that could make, make it harder to manage uh, after the surgery with DBS. All right, um, let's see. So here, someone's um, asking a question about um, gamma knife thalatotomy. 
and they read that this was possibly an alternative to DBS. Um, can you speak to right. that? Yeah, so uh, basically the gamma knife, you know, uh, radio surgery um, is a procedure where we, we use radiation to make a small lesion uh, in a, the precise location in the brain to control tremor. Um, and so that's a very similar strategy than using focus ultrasound to also make a lesion at the exact same spot. As Dr. Diaz highlighted, uh, one of the concern with making a lesion compared to DBS is that uh, it's not uh, something that's reversible. So once the lesion is made, if there are side effects such as uh, tingling or weakness, you know, in a uh, part of the body, it's typically not something that can be reversed. Uh, in terms of the focus ultrasound, the safety is improved because the patient is awake uh, during the time when they're doing the lesion, and it takes a while for them to create the lesion so that the neurologist is there and they can examine the patient to make sure they're not having a side effect. And if they are, they can stop the procedure to prevent it from being permanent. Uh, with uh, the um, uh, more traditional thalamotomy using radio surgery or gamma knife, uh, the problem is that the radiation is delivered in one shot, uh, so typically it takes about 20 minutes, and you only see the effect uh, several days or you know several weeks, even a few months after the, the procedure, and so there's no way to know if you're going to have side effects from that lesion. So in general, you know we would use that only in patients who would be uh, not a candidate for. Um, uh, DBS. So for example, somebody who's taking blood thinners and it's not a situation where we can stop the blood thinners prior to the surgery, like something like that. Great. Thank you, Dr. Langevin. Um, we're just going to take maybe another question here we were, since we're well over our time. Um, a lot of great questions though. Um, I have one here and it says, can you provide a list of support groups that we have for um, PD here in the South Bay? Yeah, for PD, um, I, I believe there's only one local group um, and uh, it's a fairly large one. So one of the things we're going to be doing hopefully in the next year is, is, is starting another one because, you know, with support groups, it's nice to have a smaller environment um, for people to discuss and get to know each other. But um, your best bet is to try to go to one of the national organizations like the American Parkinson's Disease Association and the Parkinson's Foundation. And they usually have a listing of all the support groups within Los Angeles. Um, as a result of the pandemic too, there's a lot of support groups that now are virtual as well. And so if you go to some of those websites, there is a lot of education, there's a lot of recorded lectures, there's um, talk and discussion groups, there's even ask a doctor a question. Um, so there's a lot of uh, resources through some of the national organizations um, to try to get support and more education. All right, well, it's 6.45 and I just wanna thank everybody. Thank you all for your time this evening. Um, thank you for these great questions. Um, that have come up. A big thank you to Dr. Diaz and to Dr. Langevin for those wonderful talks. Um, so um, I'm not sure I posted in the chat, but um, we will be sending a recording of this presentation to all of our attendees for um, you to have. Um, for those of you who use the social media like Facebook, it will also be on our Providence um, Facebook page for you to view and share. And um, we'll, it's up there in the chat um, on how to get to our Facebook page. Um, but for any additional information or to schedule an appointment with um, one of our physicians, you can contact our, our Physician Engagement Center. We'll post that number as well, or in fact, it's there. The 1-888-HEALING is there. And um, thank you again, everybody, and have a wonderful evening.